Psalm 15. It could be woman after God's own heart. So understand it like that. Psalm 15. Psalm 15. A psalm of David, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless, and who does uh, what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart, and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor, neighbor no wrong, and casts no slur on his fellow man. And despises a vile man and honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us and you will bless us. We just praise you and honor you for your truthful worthy God to be praised and as we praise you may you feed us we don't worship you because we have to because we but we worship you we need to and we want to we need to because we need to receive the power and the strength but we want to because we love you for you first loved us we pray that this day will be day of our worship to you may our hearts and minds be here May we not just be the people going through religious acts, but may our hearts be filled with uh, given worship, just love for you, passion for you through this day, so that this day will be mere symbol of what we will do throughout the week. Praise you and thank you for this time. Pray every single soul may be blessed through this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. question we ask in verse 1 the psalm writer asks a question David who's a who's David asks this question Lord who may dwell in your in your sanctuary who may live on your holy hill that's a question and answer comes through verse 2 through uh, almost to the end of verse 5 almost the end of the chapter and then that's the answer. And then the promise or the assurance of those kind of people is he who does these things will never be shaken. So basically what we will discuss is the characteristics of the people who can dwell in the sanctuary of God, meaning true worshipers or someone who can enter into the sanctuary of God, someone who enters into a sanctuary of God, someone who lives in the presence of God. But not only one time dwelling of the pre in the presence of God, but lifestyle dwelling of the presence of God. True worshiper, oh, man or woman after God's own heart. What is this question when he says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? The word sanctuary there is the same word for tabernacle, which represents the presence of God in the Old Testament. And we see that David, uh, when... Uh, Ark of the Covenant of God comes in Second Samuel chapter 6. He uh, places tent on a holy hill, as it describes in verse 1. And later on, that place is going to be replaced by Solomon's temple. So basically, it talks about the presence of God. Okay? And the presence of God was centralized in the Old Testament uh, and in Jesus' time in the tabernacle or temple. So we see that broader meaning of that is not just someone who can enter into church or sanctuary, but the presence of God. Who can enter into the presence of God? Who's someone that lives and dwells in the presence of God? That's what we, were, we are going to discuss. So the question is narrowly asking the identity of the true worshiper uh, before entering the sanctuary. So we can apply right there today. But broadly asking, who is the lifetime worshiper who lives in the presence of God constantly? One who pleases God in the normal course of life as well as Sunday. And a man and woman who is after the heart of God. We'll talk about the six characteristics that is mentioned in verse 2 through 
uh, 5a. However, before that, I want to talk about three introductory comments before we talk about, talk about six characteristics because we are studying Psalms and you need to understand Psalms a little bit so that you can, when you study other passages in Psalm, other chapters, you can understand better. One first introductory comment is uh, about this Psalm is it's a description of a worshiper, not prerequisite to be a worshiper. It's a description of a worshiper, not a prerequisite to be a worshiper. Meaning, you do this, then God receives your worship. We can't earn our way into the presence of God. We know that. So this is a mere description of a person who's a true worshiper. We can only into the presence of God by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are like that, one who begins his work in you will finish it. He's the one who's working in it. So his, uh, our, through our faith, his grace is manifested in our lives. And this is a description of that kind of person. Okay? So we can't earn our presence into God. But he, this is mere description of someone who has faith in Christ or faith in the Lord, faith in God. And his characteristics are exhibited in this manner. Second introductory comment is this. These are not comprehensive lists, but representative lists. These are not comprehensive lists. It's representative lists. Because identical questions are asked in many other places in the Old Testament. Psalm 24, Isaiah 33, Psalm, 20, uh, Psalm 24, and Isaiah 33. Same question is asked. And Characteristics are kind of similar, but some things are different. So the point of the writers of the scripture is that it's not a comprehensive list, but representative lists. What he thinks at that time, and the Spirit of God is telling him at the time, you know, these are the characteristics of true worshipers. So if you're on a comprehensive list, we need to study the whole of the scripture. And even that, it's not probably, probably not comprehensive list. So representative lists. Third introductory comment, which is the most important introductory comment to understand not only uh, this psalm, but many other psalms as well as Proverbs, is concerning Hebrew parallelism. Hebrew parallelism. Now, uh, some people say there are so many characteristics of true worshipers in verse 2 through 5a. If we really dig it out and think about it, we can think of like 10 or 11, some uh, authors have 10 or 11 characteristics. Okay? We can generate it. However, if in order for un us to under understand the psalm, we must look at the scripture in its literary form. In its literary form. Like, this is a poetry. So, if, you, if poetry says, mountains sing, some, you cannot say, aha, see that? You, mountains never sing. So, it's not inerrant word of God, but it's a poetry. Like flowers, what, I don't know how to, mountains sing. <laughs> Let's go back to mountains sing. <laughs> uh, if that's in the epistle, like with all the doctrinal teachings and didactic teachings, then every word has some kind of theological meaning. But if it's in the poetry, it's a, it's a song. It's figurative language. So we need to take it as such. So Bible is at least literature, at least. So we must read it with the literary devices. But of course, it's more than literature. Uh, within this literature, through these literary devices and ideas of the writers, God planted in the scripture, inerrant word of God. So we must understand its literary devices. English poetry is most often marked by rhyme and meter, but neither uh, of these is in Hebrew. There is a certain kind of emphasis in the lines, which corresponds to our meter, but there is no rhyme at all. Okay? The chief characteristic of Hebrew verse is in its parallel lines, parallel ideas. Usually the, uh, the idea of the first line is repeated in the second with a slight variation. Okay? But it is not always that simple. Sometimes a line involves repetition. For example, of repetition, repetitive uh, Hebrew parallelism is in, right here. He whose, uh, verse 2, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous. Same idea, but 
talks a little bit different angle, but same idea, emphasize. It's almost like a repetition to emphasize a point. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's a contrast. Contrast. For, his, for example, when we uh, look into this verse, uh, uh, end of verse 2, it says, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue. Like two lines are opposite. He who speaks the truth and he doesn't slander. It's the same idea, but kind of opposite. To emphasize a point, then it goes together. Okay? Sometimes another form is like a, not only this, but also that. <laughs> not only this, but also that. For example, when you look into the end of verse 4, it says, He who keeps his oath, not only this, but also that, even when it hurts. So to emphasize one idea uses parallelism like that. So uh, in order for us to understand this psalm, we have to look at these parallelism. And there, there are six parallelisms in this uh, verse. So you can find more characteristics, but psalm writer is thinking about six characteristics, six ideas through this Hebrew poetry and parallelism. That's what I'm trying to say. You didn't have to understand all those things, but I'm trying to say just to impress you that uh, um, I know. <laughs> so, so if you understand there are six uh, ideas in here, that's kind of helpful. So we're going to talk about six characteristics, six ideas to describe a true worshiper, lifetime, lifestyle worshiper. Now, to make it come alive, the six characteristics, I thought about it like this. Uh, sorry to the guys who are not, or people who are not interested in uh, basketball a little bit. I'm going to talk a lot about basketball, for the Lord has inspired me uh, to talk about basketball a lot for some reason today. But, uh, you know, there's infamous CFC Summer uh, Basketball League that will be going on starting today, I think. Is that right? Starting today. And uh, I know a lot of you have been thinking about it, talking about it, praying that you'll be in the right team and all these things. Uh, it, is un it is not unbiblical to talk about this because wh wh whenever Jesus speaks, he uses what we call parables. Parable is what people are thinking about. He talks about it and then uses it to teach the scripture. So it's like to farmers, he says, all those uh, when a farmer sows a seed, and he goes on teaching the scriptures, so I'm talking about basketball too, because a lot of you are thinking about it, so just understand what I'm talking about. All right. There was a draft yesterday. People were drafted. I know some people who doesn't like basketball. Drafted? What does that mean? It does not mean that you get your portrait uh, drawn by people and things like that. It means, draft means, it means, uh, you know, like 100 people signed up or something like that, and then, 12 captains draw out people secretly. They don't, they don't uh, tell everybody that they uh, picked this person fifth times or something like that and to, because it kind of it hurts your feeling. So they, dra they do draft. First person picks first player, second person, and then they go round and round. There's like, I don't know, there are like seven rounds or something like that. So there was, there was draft yesterday and characteristics People, captains have to think about the characteristics. Can they do this? Can they do that? Can they rebound? Can they shoot? Can they dribble the ball? Do they know what ball is? Do they know the rule? And you have to think about all these things. Uh, thinking about abilities and position and things like that. I, last year, it's kind of secret thing, but last year I heard I was, through a grapevine, I heard uh, I was picked fifth round. Fifth round means there are... <laughs> Let's say there are 12 captains then. Every captain picks 12 people, one each, 12. That's one round. Second, everybody picks a second round, 24. Fifth round, I was picked. So this year I practiced hard. <laughs> I tried to get rebounds, tried to do left hand layup and block shots. I practiced all that. Hopefully, assuming I think I was drafted a little earlier than that, I hope so. Anyway, point of this is this. Just think of this as God not picking the basketball players. But if God is picking true worshipers, he's going to look at six characteristics. Okay. What round will you be drafted? Hopefully it's earlier than me as a true worshiper. 
That's what we're going to talk about. Did I get everybody's attention here? Losing a couple of people, but it's okay. All right, six characteristics of the ones who will be drafted as a true worshipers. First, it's concerning who he is. First characteristics is who he is. Okay? Let's talk about character. Character. That's, that's what that first, if you count from verse 2, indented lines, he, who, 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 that's six right there. Okay? If you count the Bible, if you have that NIV uh, study Bible, he, who, 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 six. So starting with the first two lines, first parallelism, in verse 2 is, he whose walk is blameless and who, and who does what is righteous. That's the first characteristic and that verse is talking about who he is the who the person is whose walk is blameless whose life is blameless now the word blameless means whole or sound whole or sound it means it refers to a person whose character as we might say is morally well-rounded whole well-rounded and grounded this person is not just strong in one area and weak in others. He strives to keep all the commandments in different areas of his life. Well-rounded as a person. Well-rounded in terms of his obedience in different aspects of his life. He strives to keep all the commandments in different times of his life. What is more, he does not vacillate. He does not fluctuate in his commitment to them. He's same Monday through Friday. He's same when he's alone and with people. There's consistency in his private and public life. And he does these things. Like a, he's a Scotty Pippen of Christian life. Okay? If you don't know who Scotty Pippen is, he's that guy with a long nose in Chicago Bulls. He can rebound, he can shoot, he can play offense, he can shoot three-pointers, he can shut the best defensive player down, he can steal, he can play point guard, he can do flash dunk to dirty work of diving for the ball. How many times has he gone to the people because he was diving for the ball? Day in and day out. He can do everything on the basketball court. We're talking about that kind of Christian. Well-rounded in all the areas of his life. And he obeys because that's who he is. Talking about his character. He's not someone terrible in his personal life and good in his family life and terrible in his ministry. He tries to obey in his personal life, in his privacy, in his family life, in his school life, in his work, in his church life. Not perfect, but tries to be well-rounded and consistent in obedience in all the areas of his life. I see the difference between uh, consistent and non-consistent person like this. It's like a, a match light versus stars. Match light pssst, shines for a little while and then fizzles out. Oh, how many times have you seen those kind of Christians? Excited for a little while. Excited even for a few years, but not consistent. Excited in his family life, but not excited in his personal life or whatever. Excited in his ministry with people, but fizzles out in his personal life. And it's temporary. No consistency. But as we think about the stars, if you look at it with your eyes, the same size of flame. Stars is consistent throughout year after year after year and if the year, even if you can't see it during the daytime, you can't see it because of the sunlight, but it still shines. It's there. How many times people fizzle out after they graduate? Who you are is the first thing that he checks. Are you a well-rounded Christian in all the aspects of your life? Second, 
Not only who he is, but secondly, what he says. Talk about his words. Second couplet is, says, Who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue? The second couplet deals with approved person's speech. And it's a contrast. It's like opposing ideas, but talking about same point. Okay. The first line tells what he does. The second line, what he does not. What he does is speaks the truth. Whenever you talk with such a person, you know that he or she is telling, telling it like it is. You can trust what he says, for he tells it like it is. He's not just saying what you want to hear. She is not using speech to flatter you in order to get something out of you. When you think about the word truth, it says, who speaks the truth? The word truth. Although in Hebrew, the word truth includes the idea of what is correct or accurate as opposed to what is false, essential idea is bigger than that. Coming closest to what we might call being trustworthy. Being trustworthy. He speaks the truth, meaning consistently. Constantly speaks, so that person is trustworthy. Truth is something you can count on. That's why when we look into... Uh, the scripture in uh, Upper Room Discourse in, from John chapter 14 through 17, God the Father is described as a true God. Uh, Jesus is described as the truth. Holy Spirit is described as the spirit of truth. And the word of God is described as the truth. Because of this, the person can rely on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God's word. They're true. And he's talking about consistency of their character. That's who God the Father is. God the Son is. God the Spirit is. God's word is truthful. That's the character. Consistency of these things. So God's people are to be like him in this important characteristic. So what we say is not just one time thing. It's because of who he is. What he says is truthful. That person has no slander, according to the second line, has no slander on his tongue. Trustworthy person does not gossip. Let me say this. Never, ever, ever trust the person who gossips. I do not trust the person who gossips in, in front of my face. You know, constantly I, uh, we do evaluations in our church at the end of the semester. Always, usually the, these days, last few years, number one problem is, you guess what number one problem in our church is? Everybody says, do some criticism and positive things about CFC. Number one problem that people always talk about is what? Anybody guess? That's right, the size. <laughs> you say, it's too big. And they, don't, they buy now, they know it's not a bad problem. Every church should have that problem. God's church should be filled with people. I think number two or three, somewhere in there, is gossip. Second or third problem at CFC, as embarrassing as it is, people mention gossip. I was so discouraged to hear that. And then I talked to other ministers, they said, hey, that's true. For our church too. And we cry together. I mean, it's a human problem. It's what Satan uses the most. But nevertheless, it is still CFC problem. Do not gossip. Bite your tongue. Unless you're going to say good things about other people. Don't talk. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Bite your tongue before you criticize other Christians. I have never seen positive result out of gossip. 17th century commentator Matthew Poole said this. This is 17th century. They had the same problem. <laughs> I don't know if that's encouraging or discouraging, but it says this. Pity your brethren. Let it suffice. Godly ministers and Christians are loaded with reproaches by wicked men. There is no need that you should combine with them in this diabolical work. <laughs> Amen. It's enough that 
we, just because we're Christian, we may be criticized. It's enough that men and women of God listen, uh, listen to gossip of other people who are trying to hinder the God's work. Why, as Christians, as believers and brothers and sisters in Christ, do we add to this work? Even without it, it's tough. Let's stop this junk. And let's bless other people as covenant people of God. Amen? Third, characteristics. Third characteristic is what he does. Talking about his conduct. Now, third couple it says, he, uh, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man. So cast no slur on his fellow man is very similar to uh, uh, the second one. So, uh, the last one, so, uh, you know, but it goes a little further. It says, who does his neighbor no wrong? So, so it's not just talking now, it's action, doing something wrong to his neighbor. Remember the progression that we talked about last week, if you're here. He blesses the man who does not listen to the counsel of the wicked or who stands in the way of sinner or sits in the set of mark. You slowly but surely progressively get involved, gets involved in sin. Same thing here. Who you are comes out in your speech, and that, of course, affects what you do. and goes opposite way, goes over, uh, as it comes out, as when it enters in, sin enters in, it goes the other way. The action uh, of doing wrong to his neighbor is mentioned here. Okay? Actual action. It starts from the thoughts, and then goes to the words, and then to action, it becomes a habit, it becomes a character. Thought, words, action, habit, character. That, that's who you become. It's not truth, character of not truth, but false. It's slandering, cutting other people down. My question to you is, do you treat other people with respect, especially those who have a less important position in life than you do? Or do you snub them? Do you talk down to them? Are you mean? These verses tell us that these things displease God and are barrier to our fellowship with Him. For it's talking about the worshipers. Fourth, characteristic is what He values. What He values. What he values. Fourth couplet says, Who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord? Who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord? This one, like the last couplet, has to do with our response to other people. It's different, however, because it's to do with our, not only, not to do with our words or actions, but how we regard other people, how we regard other people, what we think about them, what is our attitude toward them, how we regard them, more internal things concerning other people. It has to do with what we value. It has to do with what we value uh, in this way. It says, look at the verses, verse very carefully, he who despises vile man, his attitude toward this vile man, he despises because that's not what he values. Right? He honors those who fear the Lord because that's what he values. So my question to our generation is, who do we really respect? Who's our role models? Who do you look up to? Because it tells you what you really value. Think about the role models of this society. A sad about this generation is that uh, there, there was a government commission in Canada studied the characteristic of today's young people, and what they found out was there was no role models. You know, I think that's better than having wrong role models. No role model is better than wrong role models. But sad thing is, if you look, look they might not say it, but there are people they respect because they wear clothes like them. They look like them. Haircuts. Baggy pants. 
Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying they have somebody they respect. They want to look like some people. Okay. These days, role models are not Abraham Lincoln. Some of them don't even know who they are. <laughs> Thomas Edison or George Washington, Gandhi. All those things, you may say, oh, they were not Christian. <laughs> but it has to, at least those role models had to do with characters. Now, their role model has to do with their performance. Superficial outside or their position or popularity is not to do with a character. Because that's not what they value anymore. Right? These days, people's role models are sports figures and rock stars. Nothing to do with characters but their performance. Look into their lives, it's pretty pathetic. But they're, they're role models. But I say this, if it's going to be rock stars or sp sports figure, I'd rather have kids respect Michael Jordan than Dennis Rodman. Don't, do you agree with that? <laughs> Yesterday I was watching uh, Oprah. That's not my constant habit, don't worry. <laughs> uh, passing by, it's just I came home and you know, somebody was watching it, so I, I was watching it together. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey Show. However you pronounce her name. And uh, Michael Jordan came out to Oprah show. And that was recorded last year after they won last year's championship. And, you know, a couple questions that Oprah asked Michael Jordan. One thing is, said, she said this. You know, do you know how big you are? <laughs> and he goes, oh, you know, sometimes it hits me. <laughs> Sounding humble and things like that. And, Another question, and I thought that was kind of a good question. I wonder, I really wonder how, I mean, think about the world population. I go to different countries in Africa, they're wearing Michael Jones shirts and things like that. And then another question that Oprah, Oprah uh, another comment Oprah made was this, you know, considering how big you are, you handle your popularity very well. No matter what you say, you are a role model and you handle it very well. I thought about that, I go, of course, he's not perfect, okay? He does a little gambling. A couple hundred thousand dollars to what he gets is like penny to us, but, you know, a little gambling, and he has a little temper, you know, he's worshipped a little too much among the people and all these things, but there are a lot of positive things that he has, right? Hard work, he works hard. As a superstar, he is. He's persistent. He does not quit. Even his sickness, he comes out and does his best. Fifth game of NBA, I mean, if he didn't came out and uh, Bulls would have lost, I mean, it would have changed the history of NBA, I think. I think they could have lost. <laughs> Just to emphasize the point and exaggerate, preacher's exaggeration a little bit. Okay? Talking about his loyalty toward Scottie Pippen and his coach. His loyalty. Hey, he's the only coach I'm going to play for. Ah, that's something that young, young people should learn. He's a team player. A couple of the best plays in his life were his pass to other people. <laughs> For as superstar he is. I think if it's gonna be, if, if, if it's gonna be sports figure or rock star, I, I like it, you know, that Michael Jordan is respected because at least there's some character that he shows rather than his achievements and performance. It is sad to see how hard it is to find role models. Verse 4 is saying that. He who despises a vile man, but honors, respects, his role model is those who fear the Lord. That's the best role model. Who has, whoever loves God the most should be our role model. Something to do with character. Uh, one social critic said this, we have reached a point in our day where people would rather be envied, envied, but uh, envied than admired. We have reached a point in our day where people would rather be envied than admired. I thought about that. That's pretty profound. What? Where is this world going to? I wish some blue-collar workers, everyday heroes can be role models of children nowadays. Teachers who, who's been consistently teaching, putting moral values into these virgin minds. 
washing their brains so that they will not be washed by the wrong values of this world. Janitors who've been working for 50 years consistently. And we should respect them for their characters. I always respect, because I'm a pastor, I always respect any pastor who's been pastoring a church for 30, 40 years, 50 years, white hairs and wrinkles. I, have, I don't care what they've done, I just have automatic respect for them, for their consistency, staying in there. How about mom and dads who raise four or five children? That takes character, people. What he values. Who you respect shows what, he, what you value. Uh, number five. So if you're going to draft a person, don't draft a person who's, who respects some guy who's not, uh, whose role model is a young guy who doesn't put work. That's what I'm trying to say. Fifth characteristic is how he keeps his commitments. Fifth characteristics of God's draft of a true worshiper, lifestyle worshiper, is how he keeps his commitments. That's what it says. End of verse 4. Who keeps his oath even when it hurts? <laughs> Who keeps his oath even when it hurts? Let me translate that verse this way. Who keeps his oath, Who keeps his oath at all times and is faithful even when it hurts? That's what it's saying. Who keeps his oath at all times, even, and is faithful, even when it hurts himself. Meaning, I mean, keeping our, our words all the time is very difficult. Just to keep our words all the time is very difficult. Okay? But when it's unfavorable to us, that is so incredibly difficult, isn't it? Sometimes it is not favorable for us. Uh, sometimes it is not unfavorable when we make commitments, certain commitments. We think about it, we calculate, it's okay, so we make commitment. And then later on, it turns out to be unfavorable. Then what do you do? It's hard to keep that commitment, isn't it? Let me make a little confession. During a, I told you I'm going to talk a lot about basketball. During a Bulls finals, you know, they were playing finals. And, uh, you know, some people made appointments like a few weeks before that. <laughs> Don't calculate your appointment time, those who met me. Like, and, you know, I didn't know oh, what was going to happen. <laughs> but just the, during the days that they had Bulls finals, that same time, they made appointments. Let me make a confession. It was hard <laughs> to keep that from him. So I had to pray to the Lord, Lord, cancel it, Lord, cancel No, I didn't pray like that. <laughs> I didn't pray like that, you know. I recorded a game and met, but I, honestly, it was not easy. I'm sorry, you know. But I really enjoyed the meeting with you and all, you know. <laughs> <coughs> Where was I? When it is unfavorable, Keeping it is hard, isn't it? But the Bible says, God accepts those kinds of people. Their worship. God values their worship. Remember, in Joshua chapter 9, Gibeonites lied to the Israelites. So Israelites make a commitment so that they would not defeat the Gibeonites. But God says, still keep it. Covenant keeping God wants His covenant people to keep their covenants with others. If you say it, you do it as much as you can. That's what God wants. When the conditions have changed and the promise or agreement and contract is no longer to your advantage, do you keep it? Do you honor your promise then? Do you fulfill the contract? Do you try to find some way to get out of what you have committed yourself to? The psalmist says that God approves people who keep their oath even when it hurts them to do so. For that character of covenant keeping is the character of covenant people of God who exhibits 
the character of covenant keeping God. Number six is concerning his love. Whom he loves. Whom he loves. Now, sixth thing says, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Money and love? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. How does money and love relate? Usury was the practice of changing, uh, charging high interest on business loans. Right? Not to do with, uh, definitely it is clearly against the scripture when we look into Exodus 22, Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 23, you are not supposed to uh, charge high interest to fellow uh, Israelites. Sometimes they would charge as much as 50%. Nothing much has changed huh? from thousands of years ago. And Bible clearly prohibits you to do that. Often the poor would be taken advantage and taken into court. And of course, rich could afford to bribe Judges, that's what he's saying. It lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. A relationship right there in the same account. So the problem is not lending money to others, but in charging high interest, taking advantage of that situation. So the problem was that those who had money were putting their personal gain before well-being of their neighbors. So they were putting money before people. Love of themselves rather than love of others. It's about love, self or others. Love for others is a proof of love for God. Our love for things of this world comes from our love for ourselves. Our love for God translates our love for, uh, our love for God is translated into our love for others. Therefore, it's a proof when we love others, is a proof that we love God. So the point of that is that even in the usage of your money, you can tell a lot about a person. A lot about a person's spirituality, character, self-control. has to do with fruit of the Holy Spirit. So it has to do with relationship with God. Every little thing that we do in our lives is not unspiritual. Everything is spiritual. Because we are spiritual beings. I'm not, when I say spiritual, I'm not saying woo, spirit. But spirit, we are spirit beings. So whatever we do has to relate it, is related with our spiritual life. You study. You can't study. Why? Because you have no self-control. And self-control is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Usage of your money as well. You can't control it. You're selfish. You love yourself. It's a spiritual thing. You can't keep commitment. Why? Because you're spiritual beings, and you're spiritually, you love yourself. At cost of other people. At cost of the reputation of God as covenant people. It's a spiritual thing. It ultimately comes down to who do you really love. It's a hard thing. One's usage of money tells a lot about one's character. That's why a spiritual person is stingy to himself, but carefully generous. Notice I said carefully generous to others. Like you receive money from your mom or dad and then you profusely use it. That's not generosity. You carefully use it and it costs you. But you're carefully generous with it. So what round will you be drafted? Okay. What things do you need to improve for next year's draft? considering these th six things. Let me make a two concluding comments and we'll finish up. Two things. Just thinking about it. Thinking about whom God approves. Who's a man or wo woman of the God's heart. Just two things. Number one is, is this. Holiness is not feelings, but character. Holiness is not feelings, but character. Like when you feel clean, you think you're holy? But you, uh, Sunday you feel holy, but your Monday is not like that. Holiness is not feeling. Holiness is character. Okay. If I change that a little bit for CFC context, holiness is not activities, but character. 
you come Thursday, you come Friday, you come to small group, you do prayer partners, whatever, those are good things. But do not mistakenly think that you're holy just because you do things. God does not. God is not pleased with animals or sacrifices. He searches for an obedient heart. Okay. What you do, right? What you do out of your love, genuine love for God, that's what He seeks. To obey is better than sacrifice, giving animals sacrifice to obey. Okay? Out of genuine love for Him. So holiness is not feeling, but character. Christian's holiness is manifested in everyday life, consistency, because that's who you are. Second comment that I would make is this. Just the relationship between power and vertical, your relationship with God. Let me make a little comment. You know this concept, but let me reiterate. Powerful ministry must receive God's power through worship. John 15, 5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That principle. Okay? Powerful ministry comes from powerful worship. So what, what this verse is saying, if you go to, the worship, go to the sanctuary of God and you worship God genuinely, then all these things will be manifested in your personal, private, public ministry life. And these are the characteristics that are manifested because you have powerful worship with God. Okay? But in some other sense, vice versa, works like if you have bad relationship with others, Bible says, it's going to affect your worship. God will wait to bless you until you cleanse yourself. Sins with others hinders your worship to God. For example, Bible says before you give offering, you take care of your offense against other people. Okay? Also, prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Something about your life that affects your worship. So in order for us to like be tree that is planted by streams of water which yields, its seed, uh, which yields fruit in season. So if you are the tree that's planted into God, worship, then you bear fruit ministry. Then at the end, verse 15, uh, chapter 15 at the end, it says, he who, he who does these things will never be shaken. Can you picture that tree planted in the streams of water? Planted into God's word. Planted into God in worship. Will never be shaken and will bear fruit. Powerful worship, powerful ministry goes together. Let's pray.